Hello, and welcome to the Texas Instruments overview of Precision DAC architectures. In this presentation, we will give an introduction to the three most common Precision DAC architectures, string, R2R, and multiplying. The first architecture to consider is the string DAC, or sometimes called the Kelvin divider DAC. The string DAC is one of the simplest methods to realize a DAC, and is simply a collection of resistors in series with switching points or tap nodes between each of the resistors. When a digital input code is applied to the DAC, it is decoded and the output buffer switch moves to the appropriate position in the DAC string. As resolution increases, the number of resistors in the string DAC exponentially increases. In general, an n-bit DAC has two to the n resistors. As a result of the string DAC's as a result, the string DAC size can have a tendency to get out of hand quickly, but there are segmented design tricks to overcome DAC size. The first item of note concerning the string DAC is that the input impedance looking in from the reference node remains static, except for during a code transition. Other architectures will have dynamic input impedances in addition to the instantaneous impedance change during a code transition. In general, all references should be unbuffered, but the string DAC is more forgiving for unbuffered references. An additional item of note is that the impedance of the resistor string will be quite high with all the resistors in series. As a result, the string DAC tends to be a low power DAC. It should be relatively obvious that the string DAC is heavily dependent on resistor matching to deliver strong linearity. If each of these resistors aren't exactly the same size, sequential code transitions may be greater than or less than one LSB. Since an n-bit converter requires two to the n resistors, it is not very practical to implement trimming on each and every resistor. Instead, the resistors are trimmed in sections, which helps keep decent linearity specs, but the string DAC linearity is generally worse than other DAC architectures. The final and most subtle element of the string DAC design is a divider present before the string resistors and tap points. This resistor is equal to the equivalent impedance of the rest of the resistors in the string and effectively halves the reference input. This is done in an effort to lower the common mode input requirements of the output buffer and help keep the cost low while delivering good performance. To compensate for this, the output buffer is typically a non-inverting gain of two configuration, though sometimes the feedback resistor can be digitally controlled to realize different gains. The high level of simplicity associated with the string DAC design, output buffer design, and low touch trimming techniques keep the cost of manufacturing a string DAC low. Few switches moving over any given code transition keeps glitch energy low. The structure of the resistor string guarantees monotonicity since negative resistors can't exist. The large impedance of the resistor string keeps the design low power. Generally speaking, this design can be realized in a small package. As the resolution of a string DAC increases, we need exponentially more resistors, which would lead to exceptionally large packages to contain two to the end resistors. Since the DAC trimming scheme is at most limited, linearity does suffer. The switching structure leads to slow code-to-code -code transitions, and as a result, the device update rate is limited. An output buffer is required to isolate the resistor string from the point of load. Typically, this buffer is included on silicon, which can be considered both a good and a bad thing in some designs. Lastly, the large number of high-value resistors in the network causes higher noise at the output. The R2R ladder is a more complex method of realizing a DAC than the string DAC. The chief benefit of the R2R ladder is that the number of resistors required to realize the design is much fewer than the string DAC. We only need one R and two R pair for each bit of resolution. An intuitive way to consider the R2R DAC is as a binary weighted voltage divider. The two R leg in parallel with each R resistor in series creates this binary weighting. As a result, we only need one switch for each bit of resolution. The switch is either connected to ground or to the reference voltage. Because of fewer resistors being present in the design, more complex trimming techniques can be employed, which leads to improved linearity in comparison to the string DAC. Mismatches in the resistors at the LSBs of the converter do not necessarily need to be matched as well, since their impact is lessened by the binary weighted nature of the divider. If we examine the R2R topology, it should be noticed that unlike the string DAC, looking into the reference node of an R2R DAC exhibits a dynamic input impedance. If you observe the switches for each R2R leg, you will notice that they are either switched into the VREF node or to the ground node, hence a dynamic input impedance related to code. Generally, it is undesirable for a reference source to see dynamic change in impedance because it requires time for the reference voltage to settle to the new impedance. 
If the application calls for rapid cycling through codes, there may not be time to wait while the reference settles with each transition. For that reason, it is highly recommended that any R2R DAC application include a reference buffer. Some R2R DACs may have a built-in buffer to help drive the reference. You can find out if the DAC has one by looking at the reference current. If the current changes on a code-to-code -code basis, there's no internal buffer. The mechanics of the switches in the R2R DAC lead to higher glitch potential over some code transitions. In the case that a single bit in the ladder changes, the glitch energy is comparable to the glitch energy seen in a string DAC. However, as code transitions induce change in more bits, glitch energy will be heightened. Another contributor to high glitch energy is the break before make switching present in the R2R switches. This is implemented to avoid momentarily shorting the reference to ground. This instantaneous switching leads to higher glitch energy as a result of parasitic capacitance and inductance present in the circuit. The strongest benefit of an R2R DAC architecture is the high performance linearity due to strong resistor matching and the inherent benefits of the binary weighted parallel ladder structure. The equivalent impedance of the resistor ladder is typically lower than that of the string DAC, and therefore the DAC shows lower noise figures. Generally speaking, the R2R DAC shows a medium settling time when compared to the string DAC and MDAC. One disadvantage to the R2R DAC is the code-dependent loading on the reference. For cases where the DAC will be updated with great frequency, a buffer for the reference input is necessary to improve reference settling time. The strongest disadvantage for the R2R DAC is the heightened glitch energy created as a result of the high number of moving switches and make-before-break connection scheme. The switches moving between VREF and ground versus different voltage potentials in the string DAC leads to longer settling time for the R2R DAC. Internal design forces the output buffer to have a wide common mode range, which will tend to make the device more expensive and provide some degradations to linearity. Now let's move on to the MDAC. This architecture should look somewhat familiar, as it's the same R2R topology as we just saw for the R2R architecture. The principal difference is that the reference input and output signal have switched places. As a result of this swap, our circuit is now in a binary weighted current divider configuration. Like the R2R DAC, this architecture features one switch and one R2R pair for each bit of the converter's resolution. But unlike the R2R DAC, the MDAC does not expose the reference to dynamic loading conditions. In many cases, voltage output is desired over current output, and this is facilitated by implementing a transimpedance amplifier at the current outputs of the MDAC. The transimpedance amplifier configuration requires a resistor in the negative feedback path and this resistor is usually included on silicon to facilitate a matched conversion from current to voltage that corresponds to the reference input. This internal resistor is much more likely to be matched in both value and thermal response as the resistors internal to the DAC This internal resistor is much more likely to be matched in both value and thermal response as the resistors internal in the DAC. This internal resistor, this internal resistor is much more likely to be matched in both value and thermal response as the resistors internal to the DAC. And in most situations, this is the best choice to facilitate the current to voltage conversion. Typically, the output amplifier is not included on silicon to provide the most flexibility to designers based on application-specific requirements. Unlike the R2R DAC, the MDAC does not need an amplifier with wide common mode operating range, since in a typical configuration, the I-out terminal and ground terminal are at the same potential. Though occasionally the MDAC will feature the same break-before-make switching as the R2R DAC, it is possible to implement a make-before-break technique that decreases glitch energy. In most modern MDACs, we see the make-before-break switching scheme. To this point, the MDAC sounds like a DAC dream come true. It features many desirable properties from both the R2R DAC and String DAC, but the MDAC does suffer from an imperfection of its own. As a result of the transimpedance amplifier at the output, the output waveform will be inverted from the reference input. MDACs are the highest performance precision DACs when paired with the right output amplifier. They have strong linearity due to the advanced trimming techniques that are available with the architecture, and noise contribution is minimal due to the lack of an internal output buffer coupled with the low ladder impedance. Also, unlike the R2R DAC, the reference observes a constant load, so it does not require a reference input buffer. An MDAC does require a transimpedance buffer at the output, but this allows the designer to choose the best output amplifier for their particular application. 
The one true disadvantage to an MDAC is that the output is in opposite polarity to the reference, requiring some additional circuitry in order to reinstate the original polarity. Having covered the three main architectures of a precision DAC, let's look at this visual for a summary of the different types of architectures. In this graph, the x-axis represents decreased settling time, where the right side represents faster devices. The y-axis represents increasing resolution. As you can see, MDACs and string DACs have the same resolution range, but MDACs settle significantly faster. Overlapping these two in speed is the R2R architecture, which features higher resolution and medium settling speeds. Keep in mind that this depiction just shows two common specifications and doesn't cover other important specs like noise, linearity, or even price. Thank you for watching this video on precision DAC architectures. Please watch our other videos on precision DACs to learn more.